Um, cool. So I, I think um, it's maybe useful to kind of, I guess, introduce um, ourselves a little bit. I, I'm slightly, as you, I think I'm kind of going to look at you guys here on the screen. And I think in a strange way, that also kind of happens up there as well. So, um, so we're joined by Professor Ruru Lee, uh, who is a performer of Jingju, Beijing Opera, and an expert in performance art, comparative and intercultural theatre studies. And also Amy Ng, who is a playwright, uh, translator and adapter as well. Um, I don't know if the two of you want to just talk a little bit about your work um, and the kind of things that you are excited by, I guess, and also how it is that you've, you've come to talk to us today. Okay, well, um, I'll go first just um to talk about the specific play and then Professor Lee will be in a much better position to kind of give the history of Chinese drama in which I am no expert. Um, so um, I was asked um, by the RSC to, um, they have something called the Chinese Classics Project and they wanted to, um, for me to adapt a play from one of Shakespeare's contemporaries and they were interpreting contemporaries quite loosely so they didn't mind like plus minus a few like 300 years or so and so um I've always really loved the Yuan dynasty plays I think that's like the first big flowering of um Chinese drama and um so I kind of read through a lot you know looking for a play to adapt and um I came across this play, um, Rescuing a Sister in the Wind and Dust, which I hadn't known previously because it's not, even though it's by Guan Han Ding, who's one of the greatest Chinese dramatists and most celebrated ones, it's um, this particular play is, is not much performed. No, it's actually not performed at all. It hasn't made it to like any of the big regional or Peking opera repertoires. And, um, and I read it and I just loved it because it's so subversive and it's um, wholly original. So it's not based on one of these big epic cycles, which most Chinese dramas are, you know, on like the Three Kingdoms or the Monkey King or whatever, you know, it's just like, um, it was a story about sisterhood. And, um, and that's so rare in, um, I think in, in most world literatures, I mean, usually, um, women are portrayed as you know like they're revolving around a man and they're cat fights among each other and they're all competing for the attention of the man and in this play it was about solidarity between women and so um and it was also really really funny so i um so i decided to go with this play um yeah what else can i tell you about it um it's um professor lee would know more but um so Yuan Dynasty plays, I think um, most scholars think that, that there's this great flowering in the Yuan Dynasty because at the time China was conquered by the Mongols and they had abolished the imperial exams, which is the way traditionally that um, the officials were selected. And so suddenly you had like all these literatis and scholars who were out of work and and they were assigned to a very low social status, which they were not used to. Like they were right at the bottom of the social ladder officially, like right above like prostitutes and entertainers. And they were really used to being like top. And so all these out of work literati um, had to earn their living somehow. And so a lot of them turned to playwriting. And by, by when I say plays, um, we don't really have a tradition of spoken drama before the 20th century. So it's more like opera. So, um, these plays in the, in the Yuan dynasty are called kind of variety plays or miscellaneous plays. So it's a combination of um, songs and dialogue and improvisation and acrobatics. So it's just everything all together. And um, what, so for me, the attraction of the Yuan dynasty plays is that it's because it was written for like a populist, um, it was, it's very popular, so it was written for like um, normal audiences, it wasn't written for the court or anything, um, so it's really earthly vernacular, but also breaks into poetry, so, and for even for a modern Chinese speaker, um, it's very easy to understand these plays, though they were written 800 years ago, you feel like you can still speak the dialogue and it will make sense, and so, um, and and also I think what I really love about Wind and Dust is that um, I feel, and I'm not the only person, um, there's a scholarly consensus that the figure of Panner, the courtesan, is in some ways like a self-portrait of Guan Hanjing, the, the dramatist. 
um, he identified with like the feeling of being an outcast, the feeling of, you know, being like a supremely talented person whose um, accomplishments weren't respected. And, um, and I also really loved that and not just in this piece, but in another one of his like narrative song cycles, that he had a really clear eyed, um, non romanticized view of women, of um, courtesans. Like, there's a really famous song cycle he wrote about um, women on horseback and they were playing polo, you know, and it's just that very precise description of their physicality and their skill and like playing with the ball and, and catching it and everything. And and I thought, oh, that's like Degas and like the ballet dancers, you know, they're not, he's not glamorizing like Swan Lake or whatever, you know, it's like that backstage look. So um, yeah, that's why I picked it. Yeah, you've answered all of my questions. I really don't know what to do now for the next 40 minutes, which is unhelpful, <laughs> Amy, thank you. But uh, <laughs> Professor Lee, I think you might be able to provide a bit more context as well about the wider world um, in China at that time and also the kind of the theatrical. Uh, I think Amy has uh, talked a lot about the context and I don't have much to add. Um, perhaps just a little bit about Guan Hanqing. Actually, uh, he was the most prolific playwright of the Yuan variety drama. And the, we use variety in this term simply because we talk about the themes, the stories, and the, technology, the techniques used. So it was a Chinese people regarded the Yuan variety drama was the very first golden age of the Chinese theatrical tradition. And it was a highly uh, synthetic artistic form using singing, speaking, reciting, and uh, stylized uh, dance acting. Um, and also he was the most prolific playwright of the time. Uh, he was credited over 60 plays and of which 18 have survived in whole and the three in fragments. Um, so that, that was, uh, and he himself was really a man of theater because he wrote plays. He also owned a troupe and he also acted on the stage. And uh, another thing I think was very interesting about Guan Hanjing was he was really a fighter for the oppressed of society. And the one contemporary uh, wrote, uh, Guan Hanjing could not tolerate the social injustice of his time and exposed it so forcefully that his audiences could see the cause of their suffering and knew what to attack in real life. And he once, in, he wrote a poem, lyrics, and he described himself as a, a copper P, a resounding copper P that cannot be steamed to mush, boiled to pulp, hammered to submission, or fried to explosion. So from the play we saw last night, I, I saw the recording and uh, audiences today may have seen the play yet last night and really could see in what way he described himself as a copper pea. And also I think I definitely, definitely agree with uh, Amy that his language, he uses the words so well. Um, he was terribly good at using everyday language and the slams, and then he can use them in his arias to be sung by the leading uh, female character. And uh, in the original play, how power seduced Joshua was not presented on the stage, but was uttered she described what she would do to Yin Zhang's mother. If you have time, I could read a little bit of translation of that lines to you. Do you want, do you want to? Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. So it says, yeah, so Paris says, if he, Joshua, balks at, sign, at signing, I give him a dig 
and a tweak, a hug and a kiss. That will make the road soft and weak all over. It'll be like smearing a dab of brown sugar right under his nose, try as he might. He'll not be able to lick it off or eat it. I will trick him into signing the divorce paper. Yin Zhang gets the paper and the bolt while I simply slip out of his door. And then she sings. Won't it be sweet to end the romance when the scoundrel to my tune shall dance? So it's uh, just a very, so it's, it's beautiful, but it's just common and everyday, everyone can understand it. So that, that, that's him. Uh, but at one thing, I think we also need to remind ourselves that was uh, written in the 13th century, 800 years ago. So at that time for the variety drama, it was rather rigid, normally four acts and with a wedge to introduce the story. And the last act would be rather um, short and the telling the end of the story. And also, at that time, usually it's a female text or male text. So we need to remember in the original play, Zhao Pan er was the only one who had arias to sing throughout the play. I think that's it. So both of us, I think, gave you some idea about the about Guan Hanqing and the Yuan variety drama. I, I'm really interested to know, like, uh... I've come to this late, right? So I've only really come across Guan Hanjing recently. Like uh, growing up, I suppose, respectively in, in sort of China and Hong Kong, was he a writer who you learned about in a school? Like what, what was the state of theater in school? Did you have drama classes? Did you learn about these playwrights? Was it just that you watched these operas um, as a kid or um, at festivals? Yeah, how did it, what is, um, what I guess, what, what is this writer's place within um, kind of everyday culture? Can I ask Amy to answer first, or do you want me to? I, I don't really mind. Ahead? Yeah, if you, Professor Lee, you go. Uh, okay. Um, I, for me, it's a bit difficult because I only had the Cultural Revolution started in 1966 when I was 14. So, my study in the school was, could not fully illustrate what education was in China. So I only had one and a half years of secondary education. And then I was sent to the countryside. Um, because I was brought up in the Jingju, or known as Beijing Opera, Peking Opera in the West family. Um, so I saw some um, theaters when I was very young and I even had some little theatrical training, uh, physical exercises, physical training when I was about 12. Um, so that's me, but I'm sure um, but that, that little theatrical training helped me. And then I was sent to the countryside uh, when I was 16 to be re-educated by the peasants. Um, I was in the countryside for many years and luckily the little theatrical training I had uh, helped me to leave the countryside to, to, to become a member of a revolutionary opera sort of group uh, and working as a medicine factory worker at the same time. So gradually I became a trainee in the modern drama theater. So that's me and I came to this country to, to study in 1988. So, so my life was not a typical, was a typical life for the generation who were brought up during the Cultural Revolution. But I think Amy would be different. Amy? Yes, um, so um, I grew up in Hong Kong, so not in mainland China. And um, 
So I went with my grandmother a lot to Cantonese opera. I won't say I was particularly fond of it, <laughs> but, uh, but um, and like I said, because this story, Guan Hanjing's uh, Wind and Dust was, did not, okay, but none of us know what it actually was like 800 years ago. Like scholars can't agree. We don't know what melodies were sung to, but what we do know is that a lot of those dramas became were transposed to like you know Peking opera or Kun opera or Cantonese opera you know a lot of these like scholar courtesan stories or judge bao stories um but this one wasn't um so growing up I did watch you know judge bao on stage and um in the Cantonese opera tradition and then obviously in tv series and so I feel like I got a lot of that corpus uh, that dramatic corpus kind of through popular entertainment um, it wasn't really taught at school because I think it's so kind of text based, um, like school education that it wasn't and and so much of this isn't written down like uh, like Professor Lee was saying, you know, there are only 18 plays that have survived and, you know, some in fragments and even the ones that have survived. Um, but because probably the language is so earthy, you know, it wasn't like considered. Um, um, you know, it was not like a classical Chinese text where you memorize and then like try to emulate. So yeah, it wasn't like part of my like formal education. Yeah. It's interesting to hear you both talk a bit about, um, I guess the kind of language being incredibly earthy and, and sort of mm. accessible for, for the general public. I guess it makes me think who, who the audience was and what the purpose of these plays were, was it to, um, educate uh, in a didactic sense, or was it to kind of reflect society as it was at the time? You know, I, I think some of the gender politics in particular feel incredibly modern, you know, um, the kind of the play issues, the the benefits of not getting married if you're a woman. It, it, it kind of talks about the sisterhood instead of relying on um, merchants or, uh, you know, officials to kind of to rescue you from your, from your perils. And so it was there a particular purpose in that? Um, I don't think uh, Guan Hanjing wrote it to be didactic. Um, and in fact, I've, I've read, you know, like a hypothesis by some scholars that some of these plays were probably performed in the pleasure quarters, you know, and because the courtesans were highly skilled and they were already very skilled in like singing and stuff. It's not a huge stretch to imagine them singing aria after aria in in place like that. And um and as I said, I think um, at the time, especially actors were considered very low down on the social scale. So I, I don't think they were out to like educate people in like confusion orthodoxy. I think mm -hmm. um, later on when these plays were collected um, in the Ming dynasty and they were um, collated and, and anthologized for an imperial audience and for a literati audience, I think they were um, edited heavily. So this particular play, Wind and Dust, it exists in two versions um, from like probably the 15th, 16th century, approximately, and uh, from the Ming Dynasty. And, and they're quite different. So in one of them, which I have, um, it's called the Ancient Mas Masters Collection. Um, it's a lot more subversive, like, uh, Yin Zhang does not marry scholar An at the end, and it's very clear that Mother Song is the biological mother, she's not the Brussel madam. Whereas in another, I think slightly later one, it's 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 called an anthology of like Yuan plays. Um, that one, Yin Zhang is married to scholar An, and, um, and there's some ambiguity whether or not the mother is actually the biological mother, or she's the brothel madam because they use the term Mara, which is more like a madam rather than Wu Qin, which is uh, definitely a mother. Um, and you can already see that's like this confusion overlay over it. So I guess it depends on like what period you're referring to. I don't think it was didactic 800 years ago. I think it became more didactic when it was actually collected and edited and, and printed. Uh, uh, thank you, Amy. And Professor Lee, uh, I know you kind of mentioned, talked a bit about Jingju and um, Beijing Opera earlier, uh, and it feels to me that for 800 years, 900 years, even longer, for that to be the artistic form, the central artistic form for theatre, to suddenly shift, like you said, in sort of the early 20th, 20th century, like late 20th century, early 21st, like 
into spoken word. What kind of happened there? What, what made that shift? Um, what suddenly what popularized the kind of the spoken word instead? Okay, I think probably we need to to answer this question. Mm. Perhaps we need to look at what the traditional song dance dance theater was. So, all the acting um, had long, long history before the advent of theater of Chinese theater appeared. Um, to even for today's theater, we still maintain the original sort of highly synthetic artistic form of seeing, act, uh, seeing, speaking, dance acting, and combat. And within the traditional this song dance theater, actually, it's a huge family with dynamic complexities. It contains over 300 regional theaters. And the some were very old, uh, could trace back to the 14th century. And the some were very young, didn't emerge until the mid 20th century. However, they share one um, characteristic, the stories were uttered by some by song and the dance. And some of those older theatres were very stylized and they have a rich uh, uh, repertoire of music and acting skills. And the, to a certain extent, they're very stylized and limited to express what was going on in the contemporary theatre. So theatres at the beginning in the 20th century, let's say, the development have much influenced and affected by the nation's political and intellectual uh, events. So we all remember from about the late second half of the 19th century, China witnessed its weakness. The Opium War, the unequal treaties between China and the Western powerful countries, and the Boxers' Rebellion. So the radicals started thinking we need something to re educate our own people. And the theater is something they looked into. And at that time, um, those radical thinkers started using the traditional form to write theaters as a propaganda tools for ordinary people. And more concretely, very interesting, those new spoken drama forms started appearing in schools, especially the missionary schools for the purpose of teaching language. So English teachers, Scottish teachers, started organizing students to perform, for example, Shakespeare's Twelfth Night for Christmas occasion. So the very first one might be 1888. So the parents were invited to see their children's or their, their children's uh, performances, that's one thing. So for the very first time, people started seeing a new theatrical form which uses the spoken language as the vehicle of the expression. There were songs, there were dances, but as part of the plot, different from the traditional song dance theater. And secondly, people started seeing those uh, foreigners playing theaters in Shanghai, the, the colonies. Those uh, foreigners who lived in Shanghai and in other big cities wanted to entertain themselves. They, they, could, they, they enjoyed the, the traditional theater, but they wanted to have something their own. So they organized some amateurish drama groups. They even built their own theater. 
And then they started doing plays in those theaters and uh, sold the tickets to the Chinese public. So that is a, a, this is another channel for Chinese people to see how spoken language could be used for the stage language. And also we need to remember there's another strong strand that was Chinese students studied in Japan. They were much influenced by Shinpan and Shingeki there. So at the beginning of the 20th century, a group of Chinese students started putting on Chinese plays in Chinese vernacular language, performing for the Chinese community in Tokyo. And also for those Japanese people who are interested in Chinese culture, the Sinologists. And those students came back to China and brought that new theatrical form back. And together with the students in China, a new theatrical form, we call it spoken drama or modern drama in Ch Chinese modern theater started. And when we say, we call it Hua Ju, Chinese people call it a Hua Ju, that is spoken drama. And called the traditional Shandong theater as Xi Chi, theater of song verse. So just from the two terms, people can easily distinguish the differences between the two theatrical forms. And also, it's very interesting when you remember a traditional theater's performer needs to have five to eight years of training at least. But for the spoken drama theater, at, especially when you want to use theater as a quick expression of what you feel about the current affairs or about what's going wrong and what is good. And the spoken drama seems to be an easy form to be used. And that's why I think in the soil where the indigenous theater was tradition was so strong that people still wanted to have a new theatrical form. And that's how the uh, spoken drama started. So it's very much imported from the West. But then gradually after 100 years, it has now deeply rooted into the Chinese soil. It is Chinese modern drama. And, and where is, uh, I suppose, a very contemporary Chinese drama now? Like, what the, uh, do we, uh, is the work there discussing similar themes? Is it political or apolitical? Like, given the sort of situation, I suppose, in, both in China and Hong Kong, and, and sort of questions around censorship and questions around, um, what themes are easily accessible and what themes are avoided by by makers and artists how does um i guess how does that heritage how does that culture how does that history affect what is going on on the stages at the moment in in shanghai or in hong kong or wherever else if that's not too big a question it it is big and it china is as huge and uh, i think people Different people, different theater companies do different things. And uh, with the current situation, I think it is very difficult to generalize the whole situation. And what, Amy, have you seen, have you been back to Hong Kong or have you seen state, the productions in Hong Kong recently? Um, well, the last time I was back was 2019, and then ever since COVID, I, we are, we are on the red list of countries. I just it's not possible to go back at the moment. Um, I do translate a lot of Hong Kong plays, um, so in Cantonese dialect into English. So I, I feel I do have my finger on the pulse. It's it's obviously very diverse the scene. Um, there is. I think there's a um, tradition, and, and this is maybe a big generalization of, you know, when you want to talk about like really sensitive topics that you turn to history, you know, and so 
you kind of say like, oh yeah, this is about the scholar in the Ming Dynasty, but actually, and he was very corrupt, but you know, you're talking about like corrupt government now. So there's that tradition. Then um, I'd say like about 10, 15 years ago, I still felt there was like a lot of freedom on Hong Kong stages. You could pretty much say whatever you wanted. Um, and I've, there was also a tradition of sending up, you know, these, um, these kind of ancient stories. So um, like one very famous story about butterfly lovers, you know, a, a man and woman fall in love and unrequited love kind of Romeo and Juliet, but they turn to butterflies at the end. And it was a uh, reimagined in Hong Kong as like a gay love story and, you know, stuff like that. So there's a, a, a lot of subverting of, um, of these uh, traditional forms. Um, Otherwise, it's so diverse, as, um, as Professor Lee was saying, you know, there's that great um, early 20th century to now that great tradition of spoken drama that, you know, so um, that fairly naturalistic, fairly Ibsen-esque, you know, and people still write in that tradition. But then there's also very, very experimental stuff. So it's really hard to generalize. Yeah. And um, yeah. Does it feel like it sits in two extremes, like in terms of form, like either kind of one thing or the other, or are there things that kind of sit in the middle as well? I guess I feel like, you know, I've only really been to the theatre a few times in Hong Kong, but it, I think you're right, Amy, it does feel like really kind of split between things that feel very kitchen sinky or, or lots of people painted blue running around naked eating frankfurters, you know, it feels like it falls in one of the two camps. So I guess moving forwards, mm -hmm into the future who are there people uh, artists who either of you identify as sort of the, the rising stars of, of, of sort of Chinese theater um, and what kind of work are they what kind of work are they making you know is it does it tend to be uh, slightly more experimental work is that the work that is um, being celebrated I suppose and that could be the <laughs> either of you <laughs> I think it is very difficult to say who are the rising stars. I guess all those who are working hard in theatres right now, including you, for example, those uh, six artists searching for the global theatre, all of you are rising stars, aren't you? And also in China, the same. I think we have experienced such unprecedented sort of an incident all over the world. As long as we are working hard and fighting in this epidemic, pandemic world, working on theater, and those are the rising stars. Don't you agree? I, I guess I'm more cynical than that, but uh, <laughs> but I have to be right. I suppose, uh, yeah, I'm interested in kind of like looking at um, the expression of voices. And I think it's so often easier to identify who those people are in film and in music and even in visual art. It, it feels like theater makers often, um, certainly in Hong Kong, uh, which is kind of the, the bulk of my, my sort of knowledge, feel like they, they fly under the radar. And I wonder if that's about audience is a lack of audience or is it about the kind of work that is being made and a big question that I, I suppose I have had doing this project is how do we move Chinese work uh, more central in, in the canon here but how do we make it more central both in Hong Kong and China as well not just in the UK you know how do we make theatre feel more um, both accessible and I guess every day you know and I don't know if either of you had any thoughts about that I know that's quite, again, um, quite I can answer that for, sorry um I Go guess ahead. I can answer that for the Hong Kong scene so I feel mm -hmm. there are very few people that actually make their living full-time from theater there um I think it's because there's a lack of um like almost no theater company has their own venue. So, I mean, there's one, the Hong Kong Repertory Theater that has like a black box studio, but for their big productions, you know, they rent space from government cultural centers or 
you know, the Academy of Performing Arts or the City Hall or whatever. And this means that um, their runs tend to be really short, just about a week. They do keep on remounting the same productions, but um, it's because the government's mandate, you know, when they build these big cultural centers is um, they, they want, and it's a good, in some ways it's a good impulse. They want it to be like big popular buildings. So they want like the old people's home to give like their summer concert and like the main stage in the Hong Kong Cultural Center. And then, you know, another time there'll be like a school choir competition. But it does mean that you can't have like these four to eight week runs that are possible in the UK. And I feel so it's always really, resources are really scattered and um, the, the runs are really too short to build up worth of word of mouth in the same way. Um, the function of critics is really different. Like they basically kind of evaluate the play, but it's not really for marketing purposes. By the time they criticize a play, like the run's over. And so um, I will say that I was quite alarmed last year during the pandemic when a lot of people, you know, in theater, were like in the UK were like, oh, well, we really want to reset. We want to like change everything. And I mean, I agree a lot needs changing, but one of it was like, we should just do away with the buildings and like, you know, like give the money directly to freelancers. Of course, as a freelancer, I mean, you know, that does resonate with me. And I was like, mm, doing away with buildings is really difficult because just imagine that like, you wanted to put on a really controversial political play that you know, whatever, it's a scathing rebuke of the Tory government or whatever. You know, if you have your own building, like the Almeida, you can put on that play and then apologize later if necessary, but you, you have that freedom. But then if you didn't have your own venue, then you would have to go to like, you know, your local council and like beg them for like, you know, can we put this on in like short of town hall or whatever? And they're going to read the play. And that's another level of censorship. You know, they, they're not going to want to like, offend their stakeholders and I so yeah a, a, a friend a playwright friend of mine in, in in Hong Kong Candace Jong she's definitely one of the rising stars in Hong Kong she wrote a play about um the Tiananmen mothers um the mothers that are like searching for the truth of like what happened to their children in 1989 and no yeah they couldn't get like a proper stage uh, venue with a stage to to um, host that. So it ended up being a theater and education kind of project. And, and this was in 2018, 2019, it wouldn't be possible now after the national security law. But um, so yeah, I, that's kind of a long-winded way of answering a question about why theater isn't very central in Hong Kong. I think part of it is structural. Yeah. It's the way it's funded. It's, yeah. That's really useful, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm just aware of time and I, I know we have to stop around half four, but I, I just wanted to open it up for any questions as well. I don't know if anyone had anything that they wanted to ask. Yeah, but go there and there. it in a bit of Bennett Pride it's really interesting um, especially about divorce and marriage and also one of the most popular news in China recently is like a celebrity couple announced a divorce and people are, are congratulating the wife because the husband is reportedly um, is currently being reported for having an affair so I think especially in China it's a very like patriotic society and if the husband is doing something wrong like domestic violence it's customary that um, the wife is supposed to endure in this case, it's difficult to help him in that sense. So just wondering if any of the panelists have any thoughts on the divorce and marriage and how it affects that, especially in a scattering of the um, So I'm not sure if um, Professor Lee and Amy, you had the question at all, but I, I guess um, to summarize that question, it, it's about a, you know, ancient China being a particularly patriarchal society and um, about the handling of marriage and divorce in rescuing one's sister and how it is that we can, uh, as writers, adapters, as theatre makers now in 2021, how can we approach those texts and how can we approach these ideas of um, marriage and divorce and, and sort of equity within a relationship um, in relation to, to kind of those older plays? Is that, is that a fair summary? Yeah, 
Well, I, I mean, I think the reason why I chose when it does is precisely because it is even, you know, it is subverting those norms, those very patriarchal norms when a husband has complete rights over his wife. And um, it, it's so, you know how like there's always this discussion about taming of the shrew and should we still stage it? The gender politics are so problematic. So I would find it like if, I would find it really hard to like adapt one of those traditional like scholar courtesan plays, you know, like kind of um, courtesan with a golden heart and she sacrifices everything to, to fund her scholar lover to take his imperial exams and then he forgets all about her. I, I think I would, I'd be like, well, what's, why would I do that? Why would I, you know, trans adapt a play that romanticizes that view of like, a man living off a woman's sacrifice, you know, unless I were to like completely subvert it or interrogate it. So I think it's, for me, it boils down to like, what what play do you choose to adapt? Um, does that sort of answer the question a little? Uh, I don't know, Professor Lee, if you had, uh, had a view on that at all, in terms of the way that I, I guess gender is represented in, in those uh, classical plays, especially? I think uh, Yuan variety drama is rather different because, as Amy just said, at that time, the imperial examination was abolished for about 100 years since Mongols became the rulers. So, all these literary and uh, scholars became nothing. And you see at that time, the con Guan Hanqing's contemporary just said that the, the whole society was divided into nine classes. Num number one, of course, was the official. And the prostitutes were number eight and uh, scholars were number nine, even one level lower than the um, uh, uh, prostitution, and then number 10 was the beggars. So Guan Hanqing himself performed on the stage and had a lot of actors' friends. And at that time, actresses were allowed. So female were allowed to enter the acting trade. So a lot of male characters were actually performed by actresses. Okay, so I think that was a very different period. And we had that Zhao Pan'er and other um, fighting, resourceful and uh, very clever, courageous female characters. And then when with the passing of the time, and it was changed, the themes were changed. So it's, again, very difficult to, to generalize what was on and what was not on. And uh, then we also saw a lot of plays um, that uh, the uh, golden heart, warm hearted prostitutes sacrificed themselves and then were abandoned by scholars. But then those prostitutes often would take revenge. Just as Amy wrote in the uh, current uh, English adaptation of Job Hammer. So it's, uh, um, I think it's just a, a different periods had different plays and uh, even within the same period, different individual playwrights wrote differently. Thank you, Professor Lee. And uh, let's take that final question as well. I don't know if it does 
No, it's 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 a really interesting question, uh, quite a naughty one as well. Um, I, I I don't think you'll have Didn't heard that hear. question. No. Uh, so there's a question. Um, just piggybacking on Amy, what you were saying about government funding be and the way that spaces were government funded uh, in Hong Kong, especially, and which kind of necessitated short runs. And there was a question, I guess, about whether or not that was uh, a means of government control on purpose, or if that was uh, a reflection of a lack of finance or a lack of money, or um, if that was just a cultural thing, a kind of circumstantial. And if it is a, an act of censorship by reducing the kind of length of runs and meaning that people had to kind of go to the government in order to use cultural space, what is it that you might guess or think that artists and theatre makers in Hong Kong and China might be doing to combat that. Is that um, I don't think it started out as an act of government censorship. It has become that. So um, I think um, Hong Kong is just an intensely commercial city and um, space is just very short and and so there's just way too few venues that can stage plays and a lot of competition for that um, um, so it's and as to what people can do to combat that I mean there um, I've noticed that you know as I said, the uh, my friend's controversial play became a like theater and education play, a tour to schools, which won't be possible now. But um, universities, are, they do have their own theater, so that's always quite a hotbed of fairly subversive political drama. But yeah, I think um, I don't know. We we have to also differentiate between like right now, the world has completely changed in Hong Kong because of the. The, the national security law that was passed in 2020. So I think now even a subversive political drama is no longer possible even in a university. And even it was like just limited to like student audiences. So um, I feel we need to learn from our mainland contemporaries because I think they're, I, I feel like whenever I meet a mainland Chinese artist, they really have an antenna of exactly how far they can go and to, you know, and to, say things in quite an allegorical way and and in Hong Kong people have not had to do it until now and this is just the direction that we're going to have to go yeah uh, Professor Lee did you have a, a view on that perhaps um, not really I don't really know very much about theatre in Hong Kong um, so I have no comments at all, I'm sorry. Not at all, thank you. Mm. Um, so I, I think we should probably wrap it up uh, unless anyone has any burning questions or if you just want to reclaim your Saturday afternoon or evening, that's fair enough too. <laughs> Good. Well, thanks very much for coming. Um, and I just wondered if we could give Professor Lee and Amy a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much for coming to chat with us this afternoon. Sorry, I'm trying to fiddle with the camera at the same time. Thanks very much for coming to chat with us this afternoon, and I will see you all soon. Cheers. Bye.